All right, so let's continue with chapter seven, event animation, making things move. Okay, so we've gone through this 10 step process uh, as a way of codifying what does it mean to have an event? What does it mean to have a behavior? How do we hook it together in our scene? So we're now gonna review that 10 step process by going through an actual example. And as before, we're going through this pattern uh, which we see over and over again. T touch sensor is optional. Everything else is uh, always there. And uh, this gives us a consistent uh, way to do business. Okay, uh, we are strongly typed. and It's important to match that. And then let's get up to our 10 steps here. Quickly review these. So notionally, uh, you want to start with the end in mind. What is the target? What is the bullseye that we're aiming for? And then we work backwards for that. Have to give it a name so that it can be uh, manipulated. Then we check our access type and data type. We'll see that uh, X3D Edit facilitates that for you. Then we have to figure out how are we stimulating this node? What is going to be the producer to do it? Is the producer going to be a, a, a sequencer, if it's a, an integer or a boolean, or more likely, if it's a floating type, we ask the same question, what is the producer? How do we get there from here? Okay. We then figure out our optional sensor. Do we have a trigger that kicks this thing off or not? Okay, it's torturing me now. There we go. Okay, once we've got that optional trigger, we put our clock in. The clock is the driver, the event driver that pushes values out decide how long it will take to go through an, an animation, decide whether the anima animation repeats or not. Then we hook things up. So we hook up the route for the trigger, if it exists. We hook up the route for the clock, connecting it to the interpolator, or possibly a sequence or a script. And then we hook up our final route that gets the output events into the node that we targeted in the first place. Okay, so this pattern's complete. Let's uh, review it respective to the diagram. We could see now that in this diagram, each of the arrows was a route. And the corresponding steps where we hook those up or steps 8, 9, and 10. Now that part about figuring out which node do we hook up, which sequencer, or which interpolator, here's our table. This will tell us, given that we have a target field to manipulate, what, what node is it that we need. So we're going to ask which interpolator or sequencer is needed. And the input to that is the data type. We want a producer that gives us the type of interest. Okay, so we can see that this is uh, pretty thorough. And now we're ready to go through an example. So let's look at the specific example now and we're going to check out a particular scene. X3D, uh, Hello World, Authors Animation Chain. And uh, of course this is in our uh, chapter on animation. Okay, so 
in this scene, uh, we know that we're going to have uh, a clock node, and we know that we're going to have an interpolator, and our target here is going to be a transform, and our goal is to have a uh, spinning set of text around our world, spin the world basically, so we can animate our good old hello world example. And since we want it to be constantly spinning, we don't need a trigger node in this example. Okay, so if we closely inspect the uh, example here, we see that uh, we've, got a, we've got a view of the scene graph. This happens to come, this is a good diagram made earlier with uh, X3D Edit 3.1, so the interface happens to be a little different, but uh, same old scene graph. And what we've done is we've drawn the connections of the routes in the left margin. So we see the first route up here that's connecting our time sensor orbital time interval with our transform, excuse me, with our uh, uh, orientation interpolator spin those things. So let's see if I can draw these a little more carefully. Uh, orbital time sensor gets hooked up to spin those things. Okay, so that gives us our first route. And then the uh, second route is right here. And that goes from spin those things, the orientation interpolator, down here to the transform. Okay, so let's draw it like this. This might be a little clearer. Okay, in any case, the, uh, the diagram in the book and in the slides has a closely annotated version of this. And so, here it is. In fact, we've added one more route to this, and we've made a corresponding uh, annotation on each one how did we fill out the 10 step process? So steps one through 10 are listed here next to the nodes where they belong. So let's flip back and forth if we can and uh, examine how we did that. So on the next page, I've printed out this uh, all in one sheet, one step. You might want to print this out yourself as a checklist and uh, we can uh, keep track of, of whether uh, stuff is done or not, et cetera. Okay, so our step one was start with the end in mind. What was our target? We go step one, what was our target? It was the transform node we wanted to rotate an Earth coordinate system. And to make this a little more intelligible, let's pop out for a second and examine that scene. Here's our basic hello world scene. That's what we started with. And we've uh, modified this scene, pretty familiar, to include animation. So, to, do, to achieve this rotating, animating scene that not only spins the globe but has some text in there, we want to go into the rotation system, rotation field of this transform and change it. So if we look at that transform, we can see, oh yes, from way back in uh, early chapter, chapter three I think it was, uh, we find that, yeah, the translation and the rotation nodes are there, so it's probably the orientation that we want to modify. So back to our checklist, what were we trying to do? Step one indeed was finding that transform node, saying that's our target. Step two 
was figuring out what is the name of it, so we gave it a def name as def2. And step three was to check the uh, axis type and the data type uh, of our target. So if we're going for a uh, rotation field, then our data type is going to be SF rotation. And if we look it up in the, uh, in the book or in the specification or in the tool, we see that the axis type is input output which means it can receive inputs, it can be receive a target, okay? So there is steps one, two, and three completed. Going on then, step four, we decide do we want a sequencer or a script? Well, a rotation is a floating point data type. Okay, it's X, Y, Z, and radians. Okay, so it's a four different floating point values. So therefore, uh, Boolean sequencer or integer sequencer are out of the picture and we don't need those for step four. What we do need is, uh, uh, so we'll put that down there, there is no four because we don't need a step four. We do need, however, step five. Usually it's either one or the other. If it's not an integer, if it's not a Boolean, then yes, it's going to be a floating point. And so when we look at that, we say, what would our uh, interpolator be? Well, for that SF rotation, when we go to table 7.5 and look it up, we say that it's uh, indeed an orientation interpolator is the guy that's going to change it. So there's our step five. It told us we want this node in there. Since we say, oh, that node is going to get connected to something else via route, we can give it a name right then. Okay, so now we're up to step six. Do we need a triggering sensor or not? And we said, well, sure, we'll put it in. The way the scene is currently defaulted, we don't have it hooked up, but you could have it hooked up, so we put it in here as an option. Okay, so we put in a touch sensor. We haven't learned about touch sensors quite yet, but what's interesting about touch sensors is they act on their peers. They act on pure geometry and not up into parents, not into everything else in the scene graph. So we can see that this touch sensor is associated with the script, the, excuse me, the text node. So if we click the text to start animation, that trigger would work. All right, step seven, we need a clock. We need a time sensor clock. So here it is right here. We put in a clock. And we gave that a name as well. And for this version of the scene that we're looking at, we said, well, we'll give it a 12 second interval for each cycle to repeat. And we'll give it a uh, loop false because it was triggered. So we'll see that loop false or loop true is an option. Okay, now we're in steps eight, nine, and ten. What are they? Those are hook up the routes. Okay, so there's our first route with step eight. There's our second route with step nine. And here's our third route with step ten. And we drop those guys in. Now there is one rule about routes when you put them in. They have to appear after the nodes that they are connecting. They can't go anywhere in the scene, but if, since we have a pair of names in each route, it should appear following the two nodes that are being defined there. Okay, so maybe that writing overlaying on there, I definitely recommend you go through this step-by-step -step process here. The book also walks you through this example step-by-step, -step, all 10, and that you see what it is. Now, a big benefit we have in the tool now is that when we actually pull up the route editor, the route editor is pretty smart and it will do a lot of these checks for us. It will confirm whether or not the data type matches. It will also cons confirm whether or not the uh, access type matches. You can see it on the interface right here. Type and access type. Type and access type. If those mismatch, 
it will be identified in red to flag for you that, hey, something's wrong here. You're not getting what you're expecting. So let's go look at that example. And let's pull up that route editor. Okay, first off, here is the scene. And here are the nodes. We see our time sensor, our orientation interpolator, our transform. Those are our three primary things. And then we see a route here and a route there. And then finally at the end, the touch sensor and its corresponding route. So let's pull up one of these guys. Let's pull up the route that connects the time sensor to the orientation interpolator. Okay, now what we put in the scene, what's identified in the route is simply the stuff that's in white. That's what goes into our route. But what the tool is also showing us is what are our alternatives that we might work with. So what do I mean by that? If we click here on this menu, we'll see it will show us all of the nodes that have names in there. Further, once we've selected a node, it will also show us all of the fields in that node. And notice how, gee, it's trying to help us out here. It's saying, well, only one of the field matches what the other guy has right now. So you probably want an SF flow. Similarly, for the target node, the event destination, it will let you choose from a variety of things, whatever has a name in there, and then given that node, given that node by its def name, it will walk through and show you what are the fields that match. And it will give you uh, only those things that are eligible. Notice that these are all input outputs. It doesn't show our other fields. Notice up here it only shows us uh, outputs or input outputs, things that could be an output. Okay, so pretty cool. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of what's going on here. If we look at uh, one of our other routes, we'll pull that guy up. Here we go. Uh, that one matches. That one matches. This connects all the way to the transform. And then finally, this route here hooks up our time sensor. Okay. Now, just for a little quick check, I'll show you why did the time sensor work? Excuse me, why did the touch sensor not, need, not be needed? The reason we don't need a time sensor here, excuse me, I'm completely misphrasing this. We have a touch sensor as a trigger node. Why was that not needed? The reason why has to do with our time sensor. This is the next node we're going to learn about. And in this time sensor, we set loop to be true. When a time sensor is enabled and true, that means start automatically. And so that's why we are looping and looping and looping right from the beginning. If we instead say false on loop, then you need a trigger. Okay, since that's a common newbie issue, I thought I'd flag that right off the bat. Okay, so we've covered about three things at once here. That's okay. It's all coherent, and we're going to see how it all works. So given that we have a scene, that it does work, that we do have routes, and that the routes are giving us some help, let's do one more concept, interpolation, and then that will set us up for going through the nodes in this, in this um, chapter. All right, so interpolation 
is a very interesting uh, capability. And basically, interpolation, you're probably familiar with the term, you've probably heard it before. It deals with averaging or smoothing or estimating between series of values. If we get a bunch of rough values, often we interpolate to estimate, well, where would it be now, given that we have a sparse data set or given that we just have a rough idea of what could be, what's our best estimate? Interpolation is a way of doing that. It turns out that when we get strict about the definitions of interpolation, what is it? That what it really is is averaging. And it's not a one-way average, but it's a two-way average where we estimate a function and we can make a linear, piecewise linear function with straight lines and that we can estimate or approximate basically any other function with it. Okay, so for example, if I had a function that looked like something like this and I wanted to approximate it, I could say, well, I don't have the math for that function. It's too computationally complex. We could, we could check and say, well, is it a function? And what do you folks think? Is that a function that I've drawn there? F of t? Yeah, it looks like it because there are unique values for each time. It doesn't double back or loop on itself. But there is a single value, uh, zero or one value at any given point in time. Okay, so if we then said, well, rather than write out some big hairy uh, uh, exponential sinusoid, what we'll instead do is approximate it. And we could say, okay, there's our first approximation, there's our second, there's our third, there's our fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, well, that one wasn't too, too neat, was it? Let's try it again. Tenth. Oh, it only took us ten points to get a linear approximation, a piecewise linear set of segments that approximate that curve. How close is it? Well, if our tenth one is still too off for our tastes, then we just fudge it once more and add another point in between and say, okay, now it's there. So just by visual inspection, we could say, well, that's within a few percent of the value at any given point. It's pretty close. And if you don't like it at any given point, fine. Draw another approximation right in between like I just did. Okay, <coughs> so linear interpolation then says, I don't care what function you have, I can approximate it. I can approximate it in a way that's not only accurate, but it's very computationally efficient. It's very fast for our graphics program to compute and optimize this. So it lets us wave away a whole bunch of complexity and just get down to the root of, does it look good? Does it run well? And so X3D does provide interpolation nodes not just for a single floating point value, but interpolators that will work on all the data types. So that, for example, if we have multiple rotations, we can interpolate smoothly between each one and show what was the change in that. Okay, let's keep going. It turns out there's a node type all of our interpreter, interpolator nodes do have a common design pattern through them. And uh, here it is. The node type is something that uh, exists for basically all of the nodes. And if, you're, uh, if you've studied object-oriented programming or the design of data structures, you're probably familiar with these kinds of concepts. If you look closely in the book, if you look even more closely in the spec, you'll find that node types are defined throughout. However, we're pretty terse about it. At least in the slides, I usually don't bother covering them. If you look in the text, you can find descriptions on each of the node types. But the node types tell you 
here was the common design pattern, here's why they work. You don't need to pay any attention to them if you don't want to because the nodes work. We can hook them up. So this is why we usually don't stress them. But in this case, I thought, well, we'll give you a little glimpse of what are the node types in case you are interested in that so you, that you can better understand how we got such a coherent set of data structures in all our nodes. So you can see that the pattern for nodes for interpolators here is one that works not just for a single node type, but for a variety of node types based on what the output type is. Is it a, a single float? Is it a double float? Is it a triple float, such as an SFX3F? Is it a normal, which is a different kind of triple float? Is it a, a SF rotation, and so on? Okay, all of those nodes for all of those types, which we just saw in Table 7.5 at the beginning of the session, all of those nodes will have these same fields, and all of those fields will have the same access type. And uh, given that pattern, they'll also have the same defaults, empty brackets here being an empty set or no values. They will always follow that pattern. In fact, the key will always be an array of floats. The fraction will always be a single float. And the only difference then is depending on the output type Depending on the output type of the node, what is it trying to produce? That's the only difference in the signature in these nodes. So very consistent pattern throughout. Okay? So that means as we go through the nodes in this chapter, they'll look very familiar and uh, very consistent. And here are the arrays here are the fields that are defined for each one and consistent. So our key and key value arrays, you can think of as holding the x-axis and the y-axis of each interpolator function. Um, okay, so the key array will be along here and the key value array will be along here and this is how we define a piecewise linear function through pairs of points in these pairs of arrays. Okay, so paired arrays. Key and key value. So they're the most important thing that we do in each interpolator. Okay, now since they are paired, since you have to, since we're defining a pairwise function, a set of line segments, you must have the same number in each. And a curiosity as we get good at this is that the value changed will have a single value, single x3d value, but that might be a tuple. It might be a two tuple or a three tuple. And then key value is basically an array of arrays when that occurs. This will become clear as we do each node. Okay, so here's our first, uh, for instance, our first example. What does linear interpolation look like? Uh, here we took a circular curve, and uh, gee, with only six points, we got within what? 5%? Maybe better? That's a lot different than 100 points for a circle, which you might need. We found that, gee, on our spheres, they probably did need a tessellation of somewhere around 100 or better. But just for a simple, can I bounce a ball, we maybe don't need that level of detail, that we can approximate it quite simply. So this first one is a single value. Or in other words, an SF float here. But the next one, we're taking a single value that's three tuple. Three tuple being the RGB in an SF color. And so if we look at the key and the key value array here, we should have one, two, three, four colors. Okay, one, 
two, three, four colors. And I gave color coding on there to emphasize which is which, RGB, obviously. And you could also plot this. It's hard to, you could plot it as a color scale and see the color varying, but it's much easier to see when we go, well, what is the red component varying over time? What is the green component varying over time? What is the blue component varying over time? And then our actual color at any given moment, such as at 0.333, will be the sum of the red, green, and blue, which in this case is no red, full green, no blue. Oh, it's green. Okay, so that's how we read these things. That's how we construct them. If we go into the notes for this page, you can see a little more detail on that. And in fact, I give the uh, uh, actual values used in these color rays. So that's a good <laughs> exercise here, is to go through those values and make sure you agree that they work. If we look at the next slide, we see another example which gives the gives the values right here but then we plot them up above also giving the values less formally not quite in x3d syntax just in isolation here and we can see that oh this is curious it's it's almost like perfect function but not quite we have a a, a curious exception that allows us to, to define two values at a single point, and that's for when we want to define stepwise uh, 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 increments, uh, non-continuous jumps in our, in our values. So the way you read this, if we were drawing this as a math line, we'd probably put a circle on one end to indicate that it was not, uh, it goes right up to that value but didn't do it. But the way this goes is as we move forward, first we'd have a value of 1, and then as we move forward, we'd have a value of 2, and then as we move forward, we go from 3 to 4 as a linear ramp. Okay, so this shows that we can have stepwise discontinuities just as well as we can have continuous functions. Okay, let's see what's left. Uh, just finishing this guy out, here's a close-up of how interpolation works. And as I said before, it's double averaging. So when we pick a point in between, given that we've defined this red line, the solid red line, if we pick a time t in between, then that means we're doing an interpolation and averaging some fraction in between the two keys. and then we do a corresponding fraction between the others and that's how we can quickly estimate. If, you've, if you think about it, that's just a set of uh, additions and subtractions and division by two. So this is why it is so fast to compute. And there we go. So that's how interpolation works. Where are we then? We've gotten through the whole first part of this chapter, we just looked at interpolation, what's consistent. Now we're ready to get down into the details of the nodes themselves. How does a time sensor work? How do the other guys work? See you next time.